Well, I almost didn't teach this study. <laughs> I got really close to not teaching it. And uh, the reason is because I almost gave up. I, I didn't know if I could find a resolution to this supposed contradiction. And now that wouldn't ruin my faith in Christ. And I want to talk about that today. Uh, what, what we're going to do is we're going to go through this very, honestly, very challenging supposed contradiction. Um, I don't think it is a real contradiction, but I think that it, people can understandably have problems with it. And so we're going to go through it in detail. We're going to answer what I think are the sort of spaghetti of questions that come up between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John when it comes to the anointing of Jesus by, the, by a woman or two women or three women. What's the real story here? We're going to go through it all, and we're going to try to resolve this contradiction. I'm interested in your feedback on whether you think the resolution I'm offering is sufficient. I'm very satisfied with it. But I'll tell you what, I could not find any resource that dealt with this in a, well, in a way that I felt was satisfactory, which means that I had searched a number of Christian resources and well-known ones and thoughtful people who just didn't really give a resolution to this apparent or supposed contradiction in a way that I thought was substantial. In fact, some of them just straight up said, this is a contradiction, right? Luke is borrowing from Mark here and changing the story. Uh, J John has it right. Mark has it wrong. Matthew's got it wrong. Or maybe they're all, who knows what the truth is. These are some of the things I found in even what you might consider more conservative commentaries. That is the landmine that is looking at Christian scholarship uh, nowadays. It's just how it is. So <clears throat> we have a lot to learn from this. Let's go into it in detail. This is Mark 14, verses 1 through 11. Here we are, part 57 of our verse-by-verse -verse series through the Gospel of Mark, which I call the Mark series. And I have a playlist down below for the entire, the entire thorough study through the Gospel of Mark. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I've never gone through a Gospel with as much detail, attention to, um, like, apologetics and theology and history and the interconnectedness of Scripture as as I have in this Mark series. So here we are, Mark 14. I just want you to like look at the story. Uh, notice the details specifically, when it happens, who's doing what, what they say, what the response from Jesus is. Like notice those details because we're gonna look at all four gospels and we'll see that the differences need to be explained. So Mark chapter 14, verse one. Now the Passover of unleavened bread were two days away and unleavened bread, <clears throat> were two days away, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to seize him by stealth and kill him. That's Jesus. They want to kill Jesus. For they were saying, not during the festival, otherwise there might be a riot of the people. While he was in Bethany at the home of Simon at the leper, and reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster, alabaster vial of very costly perfume of pure nard, which is like a spike nard. It's, a, it's an Indian imported thing, perfume they have. And she broke the vial, crack, and poured it over his head. Where? On his head. But some were indignantly remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold over for over 300 denarii. Remember the amount, 300 denarii. And the money given to the poor. And they were scolding her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you bother her? She's done a good deed to me. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you wish, you can do good to them but you do not always have me. And listen to why Jesus says she does it. She's done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. For the burial. Side note here, here's a Markan claim about Jesus being buried because many skeptics don't realize there's other claims other than um, uh, later on in the Gospels. <clears throat> Truly I say to you, wherever the Gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. Then the story ends with verses 10 and 11. Then Judas Iscariot, in response to this, who was one of the twelve, went off to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. They were glad when they heard this and promised to give him money, and he began to seek how to betray him at an opportune time. So uh, the, the story goes like this, right? There's, there's the Passover's on its way. It's two days away. Jesus gets anointed by the woman. There's a complaint about the giving of the money to the poor. Jesus rebukes the complaint. And then Judas decides, I'm going to partner, I'm going to side with those who are trying to kill Jesus. Now, supposedly there is a rather complicated set of issues going on. And there are a rather complicated set of issues going on, not just supposedly. But supposedly those issues equal contradiction. Now, let me, let me take... Matthew, Mark, and John as a group here, because they're very similar, we'll find later when we dig into them in more detail. But we're going to compare them to Luke, because Luke is the most different. In Luke, we have uh, real differences between what we just read and the way Luke talks about an event where a woman anoints 
Jesus. And the first difference you need to know as we start looking at Luke 7 is that this is happening at a whole different time, uh, at a whole different place. It's earlier in Jesus's ministry and it's located in Galilee. Now, if in the map of Israel, Israel's like a smaller California as far as the shape, right? So it's kind of long like that. And, you know, here's Galilee, right? Here's Jerusalem. It's, it's quite a ways away. And so Luke has this happening very far away from Bethany, from the area of Jerusalem. Here's what Luke says, Luke 7, 36. <clears throat> now, one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him. Okay, that's already different. It's a, it's a Pharisee. Well, it didn't appear to be a Pharisee in Mark's account. And he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. Okay, now the nature of the woman's different. She's a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. Okay, that's the same. It's an alabaster flask again, or vial. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. So he, he gets anointed in this story as well. Now, um, oh, I sorry, I meant to put it on your screen. Now, when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who's touching him, that she's a sinner. Notice the complaint here is different. It's not about the um, problem of uh, the uh, the poor being taken care of by this expensive perfume. It's the issue of her being a sinner, touching Jesus. And the Pharisee, obviously he's a Pharisee, so it's understandable that he's pointing that out. And then in verse 40, Jesus answered to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Now, this is another one of the similarities. Here we have similarities and differences coexisting between these Gospels. I think it can be reconciled, but I think we have to reconcile it with integrity and not just hand wave things away. So Simon, his name's Simon, that was the same name as, as we'll find Jesus was at in Mark and in Matthew, right? He's at the house of Simon, the leper, not a Pharisee, or at least he doesn't call him a Pharisee. So that's interesting. <clears throat> and he said, he replied, say it, teacher, a money lender, Jesus tells this story, a money lender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one who he forgave more. And he said to him, you've judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she, wa she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason, I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, you know, who is this man who even forgives sins? And then he, the story goes on. But that's the, probably the most the relevant section we should read for today. Let me point out some of these similarities and differences again to you. There's a woman who performs, who puts uh, perfume on Jesus. Okay, that obviously is a very noticeable similarity between these stories. Then we have an alabaster flask or alabaster, alabaster vial being used. That seems like a notable similarity to us. We also have the name of the guy. It's the same, Simon. But there's a massive number of differences and those differences are huge. So they're like, it's a, it seems to be a different event because it happens in Galilee versus Bethany. Um, the, um, the differences... Um, let me just give you the list of them now. Uh, it's in the middle of Jesus's ministry, not at the end. It's at the house of a Pharisee, not apparently a leper. And it's possible that he was a leper who was healed. So it could be the same Simon, you might say that, but then how could his house be in Bethany? See, that explanation doesn't really work well. It's, But also the reasoning is different. Th this woman in Luke 7, earlier in Jesus's ministry, anoints him for gratitude. She gives him this perfume as a, as a way of, of love and indebtedness because of his grace. He loves her because he's been forgiven. She's been forgiven. But the woman in Mark and in Matthew and in John, that woman, she's doing it because of his burial. It's a different reason. It's a different purpose. Now, the woman is a different kind of woman. She's known to be a sinner, right? In Luke, it's all that we know about her is she's some kind of sinner. She's some kind of a known sinful woman. Yet Mary of Bethany we don't know anything negative about her. And, and John says that it's Mary, Lazarus's sister. Everything we know about Mary is good and positive. We have no reason to correlate known sinner with Mary of Bethany. So these seem to be two different women. She uses um, the perfume, true, is used in both stories. But in Luke, we don't know how much is used. We don't know how much is used. Yet in 
in Mark, it's the entire vial, which ended up being 300 denarii or a year's wage. So the, the amount used is quite different. Typically, according to Craig Keener in his uh, Bible background commentary, he says that what was typical in these alabaster flasks was one ounce or less of actual liquid, of actual perfume. So when she pours out this flask on Jesus, since it's typical, most likely it was a very small amount as opposed to a large amount. Then the complaint is different as well. Here's another difference that makes these obviously different accounts. Uh, the complaint in Luke is that she's being allowed to touch him. The complaint in, Ma in uh, Matthew, Mark, John is the cost of the perfume. And we don't even know in Luke what kind of perfume it is. It's not even relevant. It doesn't matter. It's the, it's the woman touching him that's more highlighted. It's not the nature of the perfume because it's not a complaint about the perfume. So the lesson is also different. The lesson in Luke is she loves because she's forgiven. And if you love Jesus, it's because you realize he forgave you. And if you're struggling in your love for God, it's probably because you're struggling in your appreciation for his grace in your life. And that's a huge thing to learn there. But in Mark, it's about the centrality of Christ's death. And we'll get there next week when we cover this topic more theologically. So it's about the centrality of the death of Christ in the gospel message. That's the importance of it. The, 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 it's key. It's central that Jesus dies for us. That's what's going on in Mark. Totally different in Luke. So here's the thing. If I'm going to explain, and this is the easy part for today's today's uh, study, and it's all apologetics today, right? Sometimes we do apologetics, more theology, more verse-by-verse -verse stuff. Today's all apologetics, um, although it involves a bunch of verse-by-verse -verse stuff, but that's what it is. Defending the truth, the veracity of the, uh, of the various parts of the Christian faith. So there's three elements. If I'm going to say these are just different accounts, there's three elements that seem oddly similar. The alabaster flask, the wiping of the feet with hair, including a woman doing an anointing, and the nature of two guys named Simon, okay? And so this has led some scholars, even some scholars who are normally conservative that I read, that I, I, this is why when you guys are like, what scholars do you recommend? What books? Well, sometimes I struggle to recommend things because sometimes it's like, it's like a, a it's like landmines, you know, it's like a, a, a wonderful orchard full of wonderful fruit along with landmines. And that's like what reading scholarship is. <laughs> sometimes you get these great things. Sometimes it's just... <laughs> You know, so some scholars that I would read would say, well, Luke just borrowed from Mark. And that's their conclusion is the reason why there's these elements of similarity, the alabaster flask, the woman anointing and the wiping of, of feet, the feet with hair, which happens in John as well. Um, and the, um, the name Simon, that all this stuff is just borrowing. But I think there's much better explanations and scholars are often way too quick to assume contradiction or, or, um, fact changing, you know, things happening in the gospels. So let's talk about this a little bit. And yeah, I had to read, you got to read a lot to get to these answers, but they're there. So Robert Stein in his commentary on Luke talks about the alabaster flask and it gives us insight because as 21st century people, we read Luke and we don't know that it's totally normal that perfume is held in an alabaster flask, right? Here's what Robert Stein says. Alabaster is a soft stone that frequently was used to make perfume containers and thousands of such containers have been found. In other words, it's not even significant that it was an alabaster flask. I've even heard pastors make a big deal about the perfume. It was an alabaster, and alabaster was this rare thing. And they try to they want to they think the value of the perfume in Mark is because it was alabaster. Okay, that's probably not accurate. This was the typical perfume container. The value is that it was so much, not an ounce, but it was a whole 12 ounce thing, or they call it a pound, but it was 12 ounces. And it was um, spikenard, which is imported from India, grown like the Himalayas or something, right? This is like rare, imported, and expensive stuff. But this is just typical perfume, what Jesus seems to be getting in Luke. So that, that, that similarity doesn't look like borrowing. It looks like real, cultural, just typical behavior, alabaster flask. Let's talk about the, the anointing of the woman. Um, the fact that a woman anoints in two different times in Jesus's ministry, if you take two accounts instead of three, we'll talk about that later. Is it three? <laughs> uh, the fact that this happens isn't that surprising when you consider the following, that it was typical in their culture when a guest came over to your home to anoint them with something. That was not that weird. And it was even more so typical if the guest was a well-known and highly respected teacher or rabbi. So we even get a hint of this in Luke 7 when Luke's like, where Jesus tells them and Luke records it, says, hey, Simon, Pharisee, you didn't anoint my head with oil. You didn't wash my feet. You greeted me with no kiss, right? This Pharisee was there to scrutinize Jesus. He didn't really give Jesus the respect and honor he deserves. But that that's because it was normal. It was normal for them to do these things. So the woman, she 
maybe is partially seeing that there's Jesus, the, the, the son of God. He's there in their midst and he's been given no oil and he's been given no, no washing of his feet and he was greeted with no kiss. And part of this is maybe her trying to write that wrong, but doing it in a way that's culturally weird, right? Wiping her, her, his feet with her hair, that kind of thing. Admittedly. Okay, so the the idea that somebody would, would spontaneously want to anoint Jesus or put, put something on, perfume on him, that kind of thing, that's not that shocking in their culture. Okay, it'd be weird here in California if I went over to someone's house and some girl walked up and started putting something on me, like perfume on me. I'd be like, we here, it only happens when you're in the perfume department at Macy's. <laughs> you know, that then it happens, but otherwise you don't really expect it. Um, <clears throat> now, there's another reason why it may have happened twice in Jesus's ministry. And keep in mind here that what say like, I think it was R.T. France, one of the great scholars written really helpful commentary on Mark, who also has a few landmines in his stuff as well. Um, he suggests, if I remember right, that Mark is, 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 is the source. Luke is borrowing from, you know, the description of the anointing in Bethany and he's incorporating elements of it into Luke 7. And I, I again, I disagree with that. And I, and I think we should rationally disagree with that. But keep in mind that the the explanation is Luke's borrowing from Mark. Remember that. Because what I'm going to suggest to you is Mary of Bethany is borrowing from this real historical woman who is recorded in Luke 7. You see, when this happened in Luke 7, in the real ministry of Jesus, then time goes by, a year, two years, however long goes by, then Jesus is in Bethany. And by now, like, when you're a follower of Jesus, you just listen to and tell stories about Jesus. When he was over here, this is what happened. When he came over there, that's what happened. Once he was at a Pharisee's house and this woman came up and anointed his head, wiped his feet with her hair and cried and washed it with, with her tears. And, and then you're like, wow, maybe I want to do that too. I think that it's reasonable to say that if you think Luke can borrow from Mark, then it's reasonable to say that Mary can borrow from this other woman. Mary can hear the story of how Jesus didn't resist or rebuke and even defended a woman who anointed him with perfume so that when Mary has it on her heart to do it for Jesus, she thinks he won't stop me. Jesus won't stop me. If you think borrowing is a thing, I think that it's more likely a thing happening with them. At least that's an equally good explanation. Um, <clears throat> finally, the, are, there are two Simons. The last thing we have to explain, the last similarity between Luke and the Matthew, the Mark passage in particular where he meant in yeah, Matthew as well. They both mentioned that it was at Simon, the, uh, the leper's house. Why is this guy called Simon? Two guys named Simon. That seems too co coincidental. You know, we, we, we want to be honest here. Okay. I want to have integrity in the way I approach my defense of the inerrancy of scripture here. Um, so how do I explain their two Simons? Well, this is, this is interesting because, you know, if you were here, say a few hundred years ago, and you were approaching this passage right now, you wouldn't have the information I'm about to share with you. You might not, you probably wouldn't have the information about alabaster flasks either, right? So this is why scholarship, scholarly opinion can sometimes be slow to change with new discoveries. But but with the information we have now, there, there's an Israeli scholar named Tal Ilan. Now I've talked about her work before. I talked about it in the first part of the Mark series where we went into the details of how um, Mark, the author of Mark was likely Mark, the Mark, the historical Mark, right? Who traveled with Peter and, and his number one source was Peter. And he appeals to a number of other eyewitness sources and that he hints at in his text when he uses their names, like Simon the leper, who may have been an ex a living source still around when Mark was writing. That might be why he mentioned his name. Um, but here's what Tal Elan did. Tal Elan surveyed hundreds of years of like ossuaries, grave, grave markings, um, and text, right? Papyri back from around the time of Christ, before and after. But she surveyed it, not to learn information about Jesus. She she did the kind of boring work that scholars do that nobody appreciates, but is sometimes really helpful. And what Tal Ilan did, this Israeli historian, is she compiled names so that we would have a catalog of the most common and least common names in Palestine. That's that's the term they'll use as scholars, but, but in ancient Israel, that in this location, that they would know the names of the people that lived there. How common were they? Now, unlike today, where we're very multicultural, they typically just reused the same names over and over again. So that it would be very common to have people with a certain list of names. Like a, a very common name is Mary for women. There's tons of Marys in the Bible. That's because there were just tons of Marys at the time. And her research has confirmed that the biblical use of names fits. Anyway, I talk about that in the first part of the Mark series, it helps establish the historicity of the gospel of Mark. But 
guess what? Um, James, for instance, is one of the most common names. It's the 11th. If I had one more finger, I could show you. The 11th most common name is James. Now we have like three Jameses in the Bible. But Simon turns out to be the most common Jewish name at the period, at the location where this story is taking place. Simon, the single most popular name for people, for men alive in ancient Israel during the time of Christ is Simon. For every single guy named James, based on Talulan's statistics, and of course her statistics won't be 100% perfect, right? But there gives us something to go on. But based on her statistics, for every guy named James, there were six people named Simon. Think about this. There were six guys named Simon for every guy named James. This is why, this is why the Bible never says Simon. It always says Simon the leper, Simon Peter, Simon the Pharisee, because there's so many guys named Simon. In other words, it was just two guys with the same name. And it's completely consistent with history and with the studies of archaeology as well. Um, yeah. One's in Bethany, one's in Galilee, one's a Pharisee, one was a former leper. <clears throat> He's not continually continuing to be a leper. People wouldn't be visiting in his home. Um, maybe Jesus might go see him, but they're not going to host a dinner there. And so, um, so yeah, these are these are things that that make a lot of sense. The differences say they're two stories, and the similarities are explained through understanding the culture and the history of the time. Those similarities all work. There's also something else that makes even more sense if there were two times, if there were two times that this happened, right? Because in Mark and Matthew and John recording the anointing at the end of Jesus's ministry. Again, you're, you're, you guys are on a, this is an apologetics journey here today with me. And for, and, and I'm part, part of the reason why I'm doing this, by the way, is because I couldn't find a single good resource who did like an honest analytical work through and came to a satisfactory conclusion. I, there was like hand-waving stuff that went on or claims of, of contradiction. So this is a resource that can be out there. <clears throat> Whenever I see missing resources, I like to create those resources if possible. So this is that resource. <coughs> Pardon me, which is why I decided to do the entire study on this topic because it's so convoluted if you don't deal with it individually. Okay, so here's the other thing. My final piece in the case of why Luke is not borrowing. He just has an actual different account he's recording. And the final piece is that if it happened twice, this makes more sense about the fact that nobody complains in the second anointing about this woman touching Jesus in this strange fashion, right? It's not this like... Some people want to like sexualize the things in the Bible. That's like a trend that goes on, especially with progressive Christianity. Um, <clears throat> and, and that's on the face of it, that's wrong. Like you look at the passage, you look at the, the scripture and you see how easily wrong this is. What, what, what they are is people who are obsessed with sex, trying to read that into scripture. Um, if you want to, if you want to go to passages that deal with that topic, go to the Song of Solomon or go to the passages that, <clears throat> that teach openly on that topic. Don't read it into places it's not. But, um, but it was culturally strange. Right? It was culturally weird. And it's interesting that when it happens in Bethany and Mary does it, nobody complains that a woman is touching Jesus this way. And you'd think they might. You'd think this would be an issue. Instead, they complain about the money. This makes a lot of sense. If in the memory of the disciples, somebody already tried that, they complained about it and Jesus rebuked them. If you're a disciple who wants to find fault in what this woman's doing, you know you can't find fault in her actually putting perfume on Jesus or touching his feet. You can't find fault in that because he already rebuked the last guy that did. So that actually makes more sense of why they target the financial expenditure of the of the uh, perfume. So this is like an undesigned coincidence, perhaps. Um, I'm going to use that term here. I don't know that, uh, say, Lydia McGrew, who, who uses that term in a real official capacity. I don't know if she would agree with me on that or not. I don't, it's not relevant to me. The thing is, it's like that fits well. That fits well, and I don't think they did it on purpose. Um, yeah, <clears throat> so Luke has a different anointing. There are three similarities that strike me as needing explanation and they have decent explanations in knowing culture and history and the many differences make it seem even more likely Luke. It's just a different account. That seems like a fair accounting of it. And I'll tell you a quick story before I go into the hard part. That was the, yeah, that was the easy part. We're going to get to the hard part in a second. I, uh, I have two guitars that one is on the wall behind me right there. That's the guild 12 string. And, um, <clears throat> a friend gave that to me. I have another guitar, and that is a Larravee, and that's a six string. And depending on which one I tend to be leading worship with, they'll sometimes switch on which one's on the wall, in case you guys are like, his guitar keeps changing. Uh, that's why. But the truth is, both of these guitars were given to me. The Larravee was a gift as well. Now, people, now don't get me wrong. People don't just like run around giving me guitars. Like, that's not normal. Um, one of them was given to me 10 years ago. That's the Larravee, or about 10 years ago. <clears throat> and that was when I had, I was leading worship all the time, like 
two or three times a week. I was leading worship in different settings and run, leading a band and all that. And in that situation, I had no guitar. Like I had borrowed a friend's guitar for a season that I had no guitar and I was just praying. And I remember, true story, I, I, I never do this. I never do this. I just, I prayed, Lord, I just pray that you have someone give me a guitar because I had no money, okay? Like I'm doing ministry as much as possible. I'm working part-time uh, in addition to doing ministry as a volunteer. And I just didn't have any money. And so I was like, Lord, I just pray you'd have someone give me a guitar. And within a week, someone gave me this like $1,200 layer of a beautiful guitar and I've used it ever since. Now, now on this connects, right, to Luke and then what happens in Mark because there's two different stories. The other story, the guild, I didn't need it. It wasn't a necessity. It was someone who just really wanted me to play this guild and was like, man, play it, do worship with it, at least borrow. And, and I tried to refuse. I was like, I, I don't need it. And he was like, no, man, I just, I'd rather see you using it and you get to use, worship, use it for worship. And it's, I'm just sitting there in my house. So he forced me to borrow it and then he refused to take it back. Okay. So he kind of tricked me <laughs> into taking it. And I love the guitar. Don't get me wrong. But I kind of resisted. One I prayed for, one I resisted. If, if you told these stories in different settings, you would think that there was contradiction. You would think somebody doesn't know Mike's real guitar history, right? But that's how real life is. And the gospels are like this too. They're recording real history that sometimes is complicated, sometimes is confusing, sometimes looks contradictory, but it's because you just don't know all the details. That happens in real life. It's understandable if it happens in the gospels. I think that we can rem remind, remember this, right? I have one guitar that's a gift from my pastor, one that was a gift from another gentleman, a friend, one that was a six string, one's a 12 string, one when I had no guitar, one when I already had a guitar and didn't need it. One was over 10 years ago. One was like a year and a half, two years maybe. Um, if two people told those two stories, you would think one of them was making stuff up unless you were willing to grant that there could be similar accounts that were actually different accounts and that that's okay. <clears throat> but that's the easy part. So we're going to dig in now to the hard part. This is where I almost gave up. I couldn't find a single resource, still haven't found one. And if you find one, post it in the in the chat or in the comments. But hear my case first, because you'll probably go Google right now and you'll find one of the resources I already didn't like <laughs> and you'll share it. So make sure you hear my case. I want to hear if you've got any resource that came to the same conclusion as me on this topic. I'd love to know that. Um, <clears throat> so John versus Matthew and Mark, that's the next part of the challenge. John versus Matthew and Mark. So Matthew and Mark are extremely similar. John has notable differences between Matthew and Mark, and they are all recording something that happened, an anointing, a woman anoints him, and it's very similar, but it's also significantly different. And we have to explain, right, this somehow. Like, is this acceptable differences, unacceptable differences? Is, is, is somebody wrong? Like one commentary I read said, well, John is probably right and Matthew and Mark are wrong. And I don't know about you, but I'm not so comfortable with that. I'm not so comfortable with that. Now, I do not think inerrancy is at the heart of the whole Christian faith, okay? Like if, we'll, we'll talk about what would you do if if you couldn't have a c conclusion in a minute. But I but I, I don't think that that's the thing. But I, I definitely am not okay with it. I don't think it's true to think that the Bible contains errors. I think that's a mistake and I think it's harmful. So let's, um, <clears throat> let's get into it here in more detail. So um, Mark, Matthew, and John, they all say it happened in Bethany and they all say it happened shortly before the crucifixion of Jesus, but they do not all, according to, to many, okay, according to many people, they do not agree on when it happened or where it happened specifically. And so we have the, um, the location, is it at Simon the leper's house or is it at Lazarus's house? They will say that John, and we'll read it in a moment, they'll say that John has it at Lazarus's home. Mark, Matthew have it at, at Simon the leper's house, different location. They will also say that the timing is different, that John has it happening six days before Passover and Matthew and Mark have it two days before Passover. And obviously that's a pretty plain contradiction. This is the claim that we'll get. And I'll talk to you through some um, of the problems as well as insufficient solutions to these problems quick answers that i didn't like like when i do apologetics it, it's not, it's not like i'm trying to be elitist here or something like that i really am not but i notice when there are bad answers given to questions i'd rather have no answer than a bad answer personally and so i'd rather sit back and say i don't know how to resolve this than to offer a false resolution that can easily be seen through if people are paying attention i'm not interested in that i don't think that that honors christ really 
Um, and I don't think it does a service to those who are asking hard questions. And so what you often get is people who don't care very much about apologetics offering pat answers to people asking real questions. And if that's been your experience, if you ask hard questions and the people trying to answer them, they give you these cutesy little pat answers. Don't get like don't get mad at them. Just realize they're just not my resource. Like I'm just not going to go to them, right? Because they don't care enough about the details. I'm going to find other people like like me. Okay, I'm one of them. I care about the details. I care about these being good answers. It doesn't mean I'm always right. I'm sure I'm, I've got some stuff wrong. Obviously, if I knew it was wrong, I'd change. But I'm sure there's some stuff I make mistakes on. But I'm trying really hard to have thoughtful, thorough answers. And we'll talk through some of the insufficient ones that I found online. So in Mark 14, 1, notice um, when it happens. Now, the Passover and unleavened bread were two days away. And the chief priests and scribes were seeking how to seize him by stealth and kill him. Okay, it's two days away. In Matthew 26, it's also two days away. When Jesus had finished all these words, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days, the Passover is coming and the Son of Man is to be handed over for crucifixion. And then it's going to go on and it will recount the story of this anointing. So Matthew and Mark both have a two days before Passover time indicator. John's time indicator is different. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving, but Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. And then Mary takes a pound of costly perfume. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's one of the issues that's going on there. Now, some would say, and their solution to this problem, and I'm going to say this is a solution that I, I don't agree with, okay? I, I think this is, I think it doesn't work, and I'll explain why. But one solution is, well, these are just two different anoint, anointings. So yes, Luke is one, but then Matthew and Mark have one, and John has a different one. And John's happened six days before Passover, and then four days later, two days before Passover, we have Matthew and Mark, and it, it happens again. So I'm not opposed to the idea of Jesus being anointed multiple times, especially knowing historically that you know, notable leaders would get special treatment when they were visiting people's homes. And Jesus is a traveling preacher coming to Jerusalem. They're highly anticipating his coming. Many of them believe he's the Messiah. And so very understandable that he would get special treatment like that. That I don't mind, but there are some problems as well. And let's read through all three passages. And I want you to notice the similarities because we can explain the similarities in Luke. Alabaster flask, the name Simon, uh, the idea of anointing. We can explain all that um, with history, okay, it all makes sense. But these, I don't know how to explain. Okay, so John chapter 12, verses four through eight, look at the details. After she pours out the fragrance, right, the perfume, and it's the same amount, by the way, as it is in Mark. It says, uh, Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor people? Uh, so he, it's the amount, 300 denarii, and he wants it to be given to the poor people. This is the response, supposedly, six days before Passover. Now, he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put in it, into it. And Jesus says, let her alone, leave her alone. And then he explains why she's doing it. She's kept it for the day of my burial, right? She let her keep it so she could use it for, you know, for me, for my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. And it's the rebuke. Notice the rebuke. That sounds eerily similar to Mark, doesn't it? Well, let's let's look at both of those passages again. So Matthew 26, verses 8 through 13. And I read articles where Christians were wanting to defend the veracity and the inerrancy of Scripture. We're saying the only solution is that Mark, Matthew, and John have two different anointings mentioned. And they said, and then even in their article, they're going, otherwise, you think Scripture is wrong. And I think this is where you guys need to slow your roll. <laughs> you can be wrong about your interpretation without throwing the Bible under the bus. Um, but anyways, Matthew 26, let's push on that interpretation a bit. But the disciples were indignant when they saw this after it's the same amount. Uh, this very costly alabaster perfume and they're indignant. And they say, why, why this waste? For this perfume might have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. The amount's not given, but the reason is, is the same. The money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said, Why do you bother this woman? Sounds like leave her alone. For she's done a good deed to me. For you always have the poor with you, but me, but you do not always have me. He said that exact same thing in John. For when he, she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Jesus gives the same reason. 
for the anointing, for the burial. And then he gives a prediction about the, the gospel. Wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be spoken of in memory of her. Now let's look at Mark. And you'll see why I think these, I think these re reasonably, you, you probably should take these as the same account. But some were indignantly remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? Why this waste? For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii. That's exactly the same exact amount of money as what John said and given to the poor and for the same purpose. And they were scolding her, but Jesus said, let her alone. That's exactly what John said. Leave her alone. Let her alone. To be word for word, let her alone. Why do you bother her? She's done a good deed to me. For you always have the poor with you. That's what Jesus said in John and Matthew. And you could do them good whenever you wish, <clears throat> but you do not always have me. She's done what she could. She's anointed my body beforehand for burial. So the purpose is the same for burial in Matthew, Mark, and, and John. Truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. Conclusion. <laughs> uh, it's the same complaint. It could have been sold for the poor. Um, in John, it's just Judas. He's highlighted. It doesn't mean he's the only one who complained. But John's highlighting Judas because he's focusing on that. But in, um, in Matthew and Mark, it's the exact same complaint. Right? And, and we'll find in Mark that there's what's called a Mark and sandwich. I'll explain this later, but basically Mark is using the story of Judas and Matthew does as well. He, he says, look, here's a meeting of the, of the I'm, spoiler alert, I'm gonna give you some spoilers here. Here's a meeting in, in Matthew and Mark, it goes this way. First couple of verses of the chapter, there's a meeting where the leaders of Israel wanna kill Jesus, but they, they can't pull it off during the feast because there might be a riot. Then there's this incident with the anointing, which triggers Judas, then the next couple of verses, to go and meet with the leaders and say, okay, I'll betray him. So in Matthew and Mark, this is the reason that Judas betrays Jesus. And in John, this is also a specific Judas-focused moment. So they're, they're the same thing. It seems very clearly true they're the same thing. It's the same kind of perfume. It's for the same amount. The cost is the same. Um, and uh, Jesus literally says the same thing. Stop bothering her. It's for my burial. You'll always have the poor with you. It seems very implausible that John and Matthew and Mark have different accounts. But this is how many online that I found would try to resolve the issue. I found an article written by a PhD who was like, these are these are uh, different accounts. Um, so that seems really implausible. So then we get pushed back over to the other question. I'm taking you on my journey of discovery as I went through this issue here. The next question is, okay, well, why can't we say that they're just one event? What's the problem here? And then now we narrow down our issues into two issues. There's only two issues left to consider in this whole issue. One is the location issue. Uh, according to the critics and according to many Christians, John has this happening at Lazarus's house. Mark and Matthew have it happening at Simon the leper's house. We have to explain the location issue. They all say it's in Bethany, but at a different home. Uh, then there's a timing issue, second issue we have to deal with. And Mark says it's two days before Passover, as, as does uh, Matthew. And to be specific, that's after Palm Sunday when Jesus comes in with the triumphal entry. Matthew and Mark both have Palm Sunday. And then two days before Passover, this is when all this goes down. And then John <clears throat> has it happening six days before Passover, before Palm Sunday. Now, some people will just be like, I don't care. Like, I don't care. I don't care. I don't even care if John just got it wrong or Mark and Matthew got it wrong. Like, I don't care. It's just the timing issue. It doesn't relate to the fact that it happened. It doesn't relate to the evidence for the resurrection of Christ. I think that you're half right, okay? It's right that this doesn't undermine Christianity as a whole. But that doesn't mean it doesn't matter at all, right? It still matters that we we, we realize we're, there's a line that's being crossed if we say that we we can grant error in in the text of Scripture regarding the things that it's relating. Now you could try to limit that error to random accidental errors about timing and things like that. And you're still a Christian. You can still believe the Bible is God's word and inspired, but it doesn't, but, but you feel you're crossing a line there because there is a line there. And so the question we need to ask is, you know, am I supposed to cross that line? And I don't, I don't personally think so. Uh, and I don't think it's healthy to do so. So the timing issue, the timing issue. Now, some say, <clears throat> and their solution to the timing issue, we'll talk about timing first, then we'll deal with location. Was it Simon the leper or Simon the Pharisee? Um, the timing issue is the hardest part though. So some say the timing issue, uh, and this was a PhD thing I, uh, written by a PhD that I read. They go, Matthew, Mark, and John, none of them are committal on the timing. And I was like, huh? <laughs> and another article I read said, John is the one that's not committal. So John, even though he says six days before Passover, he's not committal on the timing. Let me walk you through why they say this. And I'll show why I don't think it actually works. Why you, why John is committal on the time 
and I'm just trying to be fair with the text here, right? So in detail, Jesus, therefore, six days before Passover came to Bethany where Lazarus was. Okay, so far, I'm actually, I'm open, right? At this point in my study, I'm going, hey, that actually doesn't sound committal. All it really says is that six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany. It doesn't say six days before Passover, he had a meal in Bethany. That meal could have happened any time after he arrived at Bethany. He could have arrived six days before Passover. He's lodging in Bethany. It turns out in the Gospels we read, Jesus stayed. He, overnight, he would stay at Bethany when he was visiting Jerusalem for Passover. Bethany's near Jerusalem, and not everybody can fit in Jerusalem during the feast. Everyone's cramming in there, right? There, there's no room at the end, <laughs> again, <laughs> for Jesus. And so there he is at Bethany. He stays at Bethany. That's normal. That's possible. But here's why it doesn't work, okay? As you read the story, um, John tells you about... Uh, about the timing, six days before Passover, he came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there. And as we basically, when we get to verse uh, 12 and 13, you'll realize this solution doesn't work. Uh, they made him a supper and we've already kind of read through this um, and the complaint they have and then Jesus' response, okay? Right, then we get to verses uh, 12 and 13. And we, and we have, of course, the chief priest plan to put Lazarus to death. And anyway, Verse 12, next thing that happens. On the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast when, the, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout Hosanna. So John's timeline is six days before Passover, Jesus comes to Bethany. And then he tells all this story. And then he says, the next day, Palm Sunday. <clears throat> so Palm Sunday and six days before Passover, this this is the the um, the brackets where you have to fit the anointing in. It seems to me, John saying, "This happened, right? This happened before Passover, and before Palm Sunday." So that, then we're left with a conundrum. We're left with a conundrum. How do we explain this then? And there were no other suggestions I found from smart people I looked at online. As I looked for other resources, there were none. So before I try to give you my solution and my theory as to how we resolve this supposed contradiction, and I think it's I think it's fully resolved. I, I'm very intellectually satisfied. Um, and I, I want to talk about the, the hypothetical. What if we ended there? What if it was you and you did your research on this supposed contradiction and you and you read answers and you thought none of those answers satisfy me and then you you ended up closing your computer, closing your your books that you were looking at and you just go, I don't have an answer. I don't know how to resolve this issue. What do you do now? What do you do now? Now, some Christians, when they tackle these issues, many, and I've been there, I was there so many times, are filled with such anxiety and such worry because somewhere in the back of their head, they think that if they, and this is reality, and maybe it's rooted in pride, I don't know. And I'm speaking to myself here too. They think if I can't answer every question and riddle and challenge, then I can't confidently be a Christian. And can I say this, as, as one who is at least more mature than I used to be, that's irrational. That's not rational, nor is it humble. To think that you have to answer every possible riddle and question that somebody poses. Christians, and, and hear me out here, I think this is such wisdom, and I wish, I, I wish someone had told me this years ago. You don't need to answer every question to believe. You just need to have reasons to believe. Do you see the difference? You don't have to answer every challenge and question to be a Christian who has confidence. You can just have reasons for your confidence. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> let's say that I saw a murder take place. I'm an eyewitness. And there I see this man, he commits murder. And then we get to court and I stand up and I present my eyewitness testimony that I saw it happen and that's the guy. you know. And by the way, I'm really good with faces. I'm terrible with names, but I'm super good with faces. And I'm like, that's definitely the guy I recognize him. And then the prosecutor gets up and they go, well, how do you explain that he has a train ticket, Mike? How do you explain that he has a train ticket that he was on a train when you supposedly saw him committing murder? See, here's where I might go. I have to explain the plane trick, the train ticket or else I'm wrong. And reality is, wait a minute. I don't understand that train ticket and I don't even know how to explain it, but I know I saw him and I know that that's true. And I think that with Christians, this is sometimes where you have to remind yourself you, you are, you is, <laughs> you is too. And the idea is this, you have reasons for your faith. And that, that may be just your personal experience. Like your life has been transformed by Christ. I don't know why you would ignore that. 
why you would throw that aside. Now, I may not be able to prove that to you. You may not believe my testimony here, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. It doesn't mean I didn't witness the murder, so to speak, or that I haven't experienced the transformation of knowing Christ and walking with God. Why would I doubt that? That's a strong reason to trust that Christianity is true. You may have, like, I have a host of reasons. I have evidence from fulfilled prophecy. I have that God's word is holy and inspired. I have evidence <clears throat> from the consistency and unity of the scripture that Jesus is truly the Messiah. I have evidence for the resurrection of Christ in history. And I have evidence for all these things. There's And there's evidence for stuff now that there never was before, right? We have more evidence for the exodus. And, and this is actually, uh, in fact, I'll plug it now. Uh, Inspiring Philosophy is coming out with a video really soon, in a f I think a few days, maybe a week or so, on his channel on evidence for the exodus. And I think that that's a great thing to watch. I got to see the preview of it. But we have more evidence for like the exodus, the, the children of Israel leaving Egypt, that that being a real thing. We have more evidence now than we ever have, have before. hundred years ago, it would have been hard to prove. Now it's a lot easier because there's more archaeological evidence. And because a lot of times archaeologists or critics, they tend to start from a place of unbelief and disbelief. And there's like, they're not neutral here. Uh, but at any rate, I have reasons for my faith. Now, if I was to come across then one supposed Bible contradiction that I can't explain, I am not going to abandon my faith in Christ and neither should you. This is, uh, this is really irrational thinking. If your entire faith in Jesus, if it only takes having one confusion for it to fall apart, that's a demonstration of something that's wrong in your mind and heart and not an issue with Christianity. And this is what I've seen happen with skeptics online. They have something that's not essential to Christianity that they can't explain. And then they, they, ju they just move over. Click. Now they're total skeptics and everything's critical, hypercritical and irrationally critical against the Christian faith. You guys know what I'm talking about. You've seen it before. If you're one of the atheists who does occasionally watch my videos, especially when I'm talking about apologetics, um, if you're honest, maybe you're, maybe you are like this, maybe you're not, but you know, there's a lot of this in your community, right? You know that this is true. Like this, you, you can't not see it. So you should not freak out if you can't answer the questions. The Bible, in my opinion, has earned your trust through prophecy, through the testimony of Jesus Christ. I mean, if Jesus is Lord, his opinion on scripture matters too. The, um, the experience you've had in your own walk with Christ and a bunch of other evidence that supports scripture that you can have some unanswered issues, question marks, and not have it ruin your faith. Now, what if you did come to the conclusion because of this or some other issue that you thought the Bible was errant, that there was actually some error in scripture. Um, there are some pastors who talk about this issue as though you should abandon Christianity if the Bible's not inerrant. Now, I think the Bible is inerrant and I think it's an important thing, but I do not think it's central or essential in Christianity. Let me explain how inerrancy works from my understanding. I hope I understand this as, 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 as good as possible here. Inerrancy is not a conclusion derived at from looking at every possible thing in scripture and proving it all historically true. That's not, I mean, you, you can't do that with any document anyway. It's not possible. Um, <clears throat> there's not enough evidence around. Inerrancy is, is a derivation of inspiration. So there is massive evidence for inspiration in scripture, right? Even just the very resurrection of Christ is then bears down on evidence for the inspiration of scripture, which predicted it, which Jesus spoke of as though it was the word of God. Jesus who said that the disciples would be led by the Holy Spirit to remember what he did and stuff like that. So even just Jesus, if you get the resurrection of Christ, you're going to have inspiration of scripture. And inerrancy, I think, flows from that. Because the Bible is inspired, it of course will not contain error. Now let's suppose, and I think that inerrancy is accurate and true, but I want to do a favor for Christians who feel like they're struggling on that issue. I think that your view, if you were to suppose that inerrancy is not true, that, that the Bible, God just didn't care if they got little piddly things wrong. Like he just didn't care. He just couldn't care less. He's like, okay, okay. John thought it was six days. Mark thought it was two days. I don't even care. The point is I want you guys to get the lesson that's here, right? That there are some facts God didn't choose to correct and he just preserved the, still inspired, preserved the truth of his word. Um, I think this creates problems, but it doesn't ruin your Christian faith. It does create problems because you do open the Bible. You then are now going to become really every guy I've seen go down this road who rejects inerrancy. They become a, fl and you don't have to be this way, but it, it seems like it happens frequently. They become a flippant arbiter of what is true in scripture versus what is not true in scripture. And so it's hard for scripture to have the, the authority it should have in our life if you don't have that view of inerrancy, but it can happen. There are some who, who don't go down that road. And, um, and it's possible, um, but it seems really quickly that people just start, they read a passage and like, yeah, that's probably erroneous. And, oh, that's probably true. And it's like, you're, 
Like you're definitely not as reliable as scripture. <laughs> That's for sure. So that could be a little bit dangerous, but this shouldn't ruin your faith. This shouldn't end your trust in Christ. So unanswered issues should not ruin your trust in Christ. Like the, the resurrection of Christ is the center of the Christian faith, the person and resurrection and work of Christ, not the inerrancy of scripture. The inspiration of scripture follows logically, you know, from the resurrection and from the central things in the Christian faith. Like it, if you deny the inspiration of scripture, you're being a ridiculously inconsistent Christian. But if you think that there may be errors, you should still be able to sleep at night. I think you're wrong and I think it's unhealthy and I think it's going to cause you harm. I don't think your your faith is ruined at that point. So here we go. I'm make I, I'm, some people I'm bringing comfort to, and others I'm going to make upset with this. I, I ask only that you don't react with your gut. Like make sure you understood what I've said and what I'm saying here. Now let's go back through this and let's ask this question: Can Mark be fairly seen as consistent with John's telling of this event as just before Palm Sunday? Can I go to Mark? Because remember my study's in Mark primarily. So I started with Mark, and then we'll go back to Matthew later. So I'm taking you through my actual study process this week. I thought, John locks it in at six days before. I haven't heard anybody try to make a case, really make a case, detailed, that Mark and Matthew can be seen uh, to be flexible on the timing. They're non-committal. Perhaps in Mark and Matthew, you're allowed to say this, this food thing happened, the anointing happened days prior. So I'm sure it exists somewhere, and if someone has this detailed analysis, share it, please, below. But having studied the passage already, I looked at it again. I looked at Mark again, and we're going to do it together now. And we're asking this question. Can Mark, can Mark's time indicator of two days before Passover, can that somehow not apply to the anointing? That's the question. And then can we extend that to Matthew? We'll look at that afterwards. So here we are. Let's go through Mark 14. And I think we will find a satisfactory answer. Um, and, and it's going to center around the idea of a Mark and sandwich. Okay. Um, and okay. For those, let me, let me pause and tell you this real quick. If you haven't heard this before, you need to understand this concept of what a Mark and sandwich is. So a sandwich is like is like bread, you know, meat, bread. Okay, so bread, meat, bread, and the Mark and sandwich is a storytelling structure that Mark uses frequently. This is frequently seen. I've been going over it in the Mark series. We've been talking about Mark and sandwiches. This is where Mark starts a story, interrupts it with a separate, different story, and then ends the first story. So the first story ends on like a cliffhanger or. It, interrupted and then he finishes it later after the middle story and the reason he does this is because mark in the gospel under the inspiration of the spirit mark is trying to use this story the middle one to give commentary on the story that was interrupted mark is a mark and sandwich in mark 14 here's how the sandwich works in mark 14 verses 1 through 2 now the Passover and unleavened bread were two days away and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how they might seize him by stealth and kill him for they were saying not during the festival, otherwise there might be a riot of the people. Mark's first part of his sandwich is first piece of bread. They, they want to attack Jesus, they want to kill Jesus, but they can't because there'll be a riot among the people, so they have no solution. Then he tells the story, verses three through nine, of the anointing, which is the occasion that offends Judas and then in verse 10, we get to the end of the, of the sandwich, the second piece of bread. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12, went off to the chief priest in order to betray him to them. And they were glad when they heard this. Why? Because it solves the problem they had in verses 1 and 2. This is a Mark and sandwich. So the theory is this. This is a meeting. Mark's two days before Passover in Mark 14, and in Matthew as well, we'll get there in a minute. And I think Matthew makes it even stronger, this case. Um, there's Mark's like this. Hey, two days before Passover... The high priests and his and his ruling leaders, they had a meeting together to plot against Jesus. But they had a problem in their meeting. They, they couldn't get Jesus in public and they didn't have access to him in private. And so let me tell you a story that relates to this. Jesus, while he was at Bethany, he had this event where there was the anointing and then they were like, give it to the poor. And Jesus was like, psh, 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 you're being dumb. And Judas was offended. And the next thing is Judas becomes the solution to this plot with the high priests. Uh, Mark then, in my theory here, <laughs> and, I, and I didn't know if anybody else had come up with this, was was dating not the meal. He's dating the chief priests and scribes meeting together and having a plot. Right? There's a meeting where these leaders are plotting how they can kill Jesus and they realize their dilemma. Now, this could be a weak part. Of, this, admittedly, okay, full disclosure, this could be a weak spot in my theory. Because Mark 14 verses 1 and 2, while it does 
say two days and then it relates something about that. It has nothing to do with this feast or this meal or this, this anointing moment. It has everything to do with a, a, something that happened somewhere else. He doesn't specifically say there's a meeting, right? So he doesn't say two days, there's a meeting. So I admit that. But there had to be some kind of meeting because they have an agreement they've come to. The chief priests and the scribes, they have an agreement. And they're obviously plotting because they're seeking by stealth how to kill him. This is not something they're having like a discussion publicly about. They're having it in private. Maybe Nicodemus was the inside man. He got saved uh, and ended up later telling the church about this meeting. But they said, like, not during the festival. Otherwise, there might be a riot among the people. So this could imply a meeting because they would have to get together to have that discussion. So then Mark 3 through 9 again, it happens while he's at Bethany. Notice the timing indicator is different. Mark, let me highlight the important sections. Um, two days away from unleavened bread and Passover and the chief priests and scribes, and I'll add, were having a meeting. Then he switches subjects. While he was at Bethany, or in Bethany, at the home of Simon the leper reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster of aisle. And so we have an, a separate event. The timing indicator for the meal is just while he's at Bethany. That is actually a very generic timing indicator, isn't it? Right? Two days before Passover, there's a meeting. And, and by the way, let me insert the meat of my sandwich. While Jesus was at Bethany, there was this event that relates to the meeting I'm telling you about now. Do you catch my point? I think you do. Um, so technically, Jesus was at Bethany for a much wider period than, than just two days before Passover. Jesus was at Bethany long before Passover days before Passover. He stayed there. This is even true in Matthew and Mark, not just John. In Mark 11, 11, before the, um, this is key, catch me here. I know I've been talking for a while now, right? So you might lose me, but in Mark 11, 11, this is before the Palm Sunday event. It says that Jesus was lodging at Bethany. Jesus was at Bethany. In Matthew um, um, 21, I think it is, it also says that Jesus was, was going to Bethany before Palm Sunday. So both Mark and Matthew have Jesus at Bethany for a whole season of time, extending from before Palm Sunday to after. This opens the door for the phrase, while at Bethany, to mean six days before Passover. That, that would be consistent. Now, let's talk about um, the conclusion here, if I'm right. And we're going to push on this with checking um, Matthew as well in a second. But my thought is Mark didn't relocate it chronologically. That's not what he's doing. Mark is not saying, I'll pretend it happened when it didn't. Mark thematically moves it, right? He's, he dates the meeting and then he tells you a related story that happened a few days prior. He's fitting it thematically because it relates to the plot. Now, how can I support that claim? Is there evidence that I can bring in because you, you have to admit it's possible like okay well, Mark could be doing that right while I Bethany that could be a generic sense but how can I support these claims um well one, one is to find a motive find like why would Mark not tell it chronologically what motive would the with the gospel of Mark writing author have to to move it from its chronological moment and share it thematically at a later time. First off, I'll just acknowledge that the Gospels do this a lot. They share things thematically all the time. If you don't have specific chronological time indicators, the event may not have happened at that time. It might be related because it's a theme. We do this in stories in our lives. I, might, I told you a story about two guitars that were years apart, right? And, um, and we do this all the time. But in Mark specifically, chapters 11 through 13, right, where, where he should have shared the story chronologically is in chapter 11. That's where it would have fit, the anointing at Bethany. But in chapters 11 through 13, Mark is obsessed with other issues, right? Mark is doing, he's very thematic in his sharing of, of Jesus's ministry. And in Mark 11 through 13, he's about judgment on Jerusalem. So it makes sense that he tells the story of the anointing, which has to do with the death of Jesus, not judgment on Jerusalem. He tells it now in Mark 14, when the whole gospel has shifted to the topic of the death of Christ. Because Mark 14 is that moment. Boom. Now it's about the death of Christ. Now what's interesting is that Matthew's the same. Matthew supports this as well. Matthew chapter like 21 through 20, 25, I think it is. The, the, the thematic elements here don't fit with, a, with it being a good time to tell the story of the anointing of Jesus. It's in Matthew 26 that now it's like, okay, now we're dealing with the death of Christ. Now we'll tell that story. Now, John, he has no such motive. John has no reason to wait to tell the story. So he tells it when it chronologically happened because John doesn't have an Olivet Discourse right, where Jesus talks about the end times and the destruction of Jerusalem and all that. He doesn't have the same section and segment that's going on in Matthew and Mark. So he has no need to tell the story at a different location. So he puts it when it chronologically happened. All of that makes a lot of sense to me. 
So the old Mark and Sandwich thing supports it. And without any specific reason to tell me that the meal in Bethany is forced to happen two days before Passover, I, I think that it's a plausible case. Now my theory can get extra support from Matthew. In Matthew 26, it makes explicit what I think is implicit in Mark, which is a meeting two days before Passover by the scribes and the high priests, not the meal that happened in a general time in Bethany. So here we are, Matthew 26, verse 1. When Jesus had finished all these words, ah, there you are. Um, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days, the Passover is coming and the Son of Man is to be handed over for crucifixion. And notice the next thing Mark mentions. Then, what's the then? Well, then would be, you know, he's, he's talking after Jesus says two days before Passover. Okay, so two day, in two days, Passover is coming. So this is two days before Passover. The chief priests and the elders of the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest named Caiaphas. And they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. Wait, Matthew makes it absolutely explicit. Um, now, I mean, I had already read Matthew and John multiple times at this point in my study, but I hadn't asked the question of how to reconcile Mark with having a generic time period for the meal. So I come up with my idea, my theory. And I, I wrote it in a big Word document where I'm working through all this stuff. And I say, okay, well, here's a theory that might work. Mark has a meeting he's talking about happening two days before. Well, then when I go to Matthew to double check and see if Matthew's consistent with my theory here, I read, it is a meeting. <laughs> like, this is What was implicit in Mark is explicit in Matthew. The chief priests, the elders of the people, they literally were gathered together when? They were gathered together two days before Passover. This is really significant. And the next thing, and then there's the conundrum, right? But we can't grab him during the feast because there's a there's going to be a riot. And then he, then Matthew tells the story at Bethany, at Simon the leper's house, alabaster vial, they poured it out. What about the poor? Hey, she did it for my burial. And the next thing that happens in verse 14, then Judas goes out to the chief priests and he asks for money and he decides to betray Jesus. This is... The same thing again. And Matthew gives us more support, just like Mark did, um, when he says, two days before Passover, there's a meeting. But when he talks about the meal, which happened probably uh, four days prior to that, it just says, now when Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper. This is a generic time. This isn't two days before Passover. He's offered a new time indicator, and it's a generic time. When Jesus was in Bethany. Again, Matthew, Mark, John, it's consistent. Jesus spent time in Bethany for the whole season of Passover from long before until he would depart finally and, and continue his traveling and speaking in other locations. This, to me, seems pretty solid. And I'm like, why on earth have, have people been saying that there's just contradiction here when this seems like a really reasonable thing that came, I came to without any helps. I mean, just looking at the text by itself, which is sometimes what you have to do. You have to set aside all commentaries and just read the passages by yourself and look for how they might work together reasonably. Um, one issue's left. All right. One issue's left. Was it at Lazarus's house or was it at Simon's house? If John and Matthew Mark are talking about the same thing, why is it supposedly at two different homes? And here, I want to say it's not uh, Matthew and Mark that are non-committal. They clearly say it's at Simon the leper's home. I think it's John that's non-committal, but we'll talk through it here. Some people would offer what I think is probably not the best explanation. It's possible. Okay, it is possible. I don't want to burn bridges here, but I don't, I don't prefer it. Okay, and one explanation is it's possible that Lazarus, Mary, and Martha all living together are living under the home of their father, and his name is Simon, and he was a leper, perhaps, who was healed by Jesus, right? So he's called Simon the leper. And that's actually entirely possible, right? That could totally work. What we don't have is evidence that confirms it, right? We don't have, like, external something to help bolster the support of it. So it's possible, but it's kind of an argument from silence. Um, so whose house are you going to? It depends on who you know at that house, right? If you know Lazarus, you say, I'm going to Lazarus's house. But if you know Simon, you say, I'm going to Simon's house. If you're John and you've written about, and this is true with John, he's the only one that writes about the resurrection of Lazarus. Then when you mention the home, you mention Lazarus. And if you're Mark, who doesn't mention Lazarus, right? Doesn't mention Mary of Bethany, right? He just, he just says Simon the leper's home. Maybe Simon the leper was still alive and accessible to Mark's community the people he was initially writing it for. And um, and so that's why he does it that way. So that works. Like that fits. 
it's just lacking confirmation, right? Um, so what would my answer be to this? Well, in John chapter 12, verse one, we read that, honestly, I don't think we're committed to thinking this happened at Lazarus's home. So let me walk you through this. I think it's John that's not committal. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Let's just look at the grammar. Jesus goes where? To Bethany. That's a city where Lazarus was. Where was Lazarus? He was in Bethany, the city. Okay, there's nothing there about the home. Right? Then you go on, it says, so they made him a supper there. Where's the there? He didn't, he didn't mention Lazarus' home. The there, contextually, is Bethany. So John only commits to us that this supper happened at Bethany, right? Bethany's where Lazarus was and it's where the supper was. And Martha's there serving and Lazarus is reclining at the table. Now you might think if Martha's serving, it has to be Martha's home. That's not rational to say that has to be. Um, there's probably a lot of people, right? There's the disciples of Jesus. The home is probably packed right now. So I would expect help coming from other people, especially people who love Jesus and want to serve. And so Lazarus is there. He's reclining at the table. Why? Why would Lazarus be reclining? Well, Lazarus was raised from the dead not too long ago by Jesus. It makes sense that he would be one of the honored guests as well. And so he's not even mentioned as being the homeowner. Nothing there is committal. Nothing there is committal about where the meal happened. You can assume it's Lazarus's home because Martha's serving, but that's not what it says. It could easily be, and here's my thought, John doesn't care explaining to you whose home it's at because John has limited space to write about Jesus right? And he doesn't want to introduce a new person to you, Simon the leper. He's already told you about one family, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus in Bethany. And they're specifically related to this story. He's not interested in the homeowner right now. The homeowner doesn't really factor into it. So he just talks around the issue of the house. Okay. He came to Bethany, you know, where Lazarus was, right? And Lazarus was there at the meal. And then Martha's there and Mary is the one who anoints him with the oil. I think this is completely satisfactory. I am truly intellectually satisfied with this answer and I don't like settling until I have them. I could, maybe I missed something. I've read the passages many times and I don't see any problems that are there. Um, if you guys think there's an issue with my resolution, I'd like to know. But remind yourself of this, that perhaps I've taken you on a journey of anxiety <clears throat> and you felt as you heard about the supposed contradiction and when you heard that I was, I almost gave up, which I put on the thumbnail, which meant I almost gave up looking for a resolution. I didn't give up on Christ. I'm giving my faith or my trust or my appreciation for God's holy word or even the inerrancy of scripture. I just would have been like, I don't know the answer. I give up trying. I, I don't know how to resolve that. It's unresolved and I'm okay with that. But perhaps for you, it was an anxiety issue. And, and, and this would be me years ago. I would have been in your exact shoes like, oh, like I have to have the answer of everything or else everything falls apart. Um, what I want to remind you is this. Now that you have an intellectually satisfying answer that connects all the dots and says, wow, these read like real historical accounts written by different people. Now that you have that, do you look back at that anxiety and say, why was I freaking out? Like I really did not need to freak out just now. I could have just been totally chill. I didn't need to spaz. Remind yourself of that because I've been on that roller coaster a thousand times and maybe you have been on it a hundred times or maybe 900 times or maybe 2000 times where you're like, Here's the thing, I don't know how to answer. Oh no, and you're free falling, right? And then you find the solution and it's really reasonable and good and solid. And you're like, oh, I'm good. And then you find another thing. Oh, oh, I don't know how to answer this. Like at some point, your confidence in scripture needs to go up and your ability to just say, I have some things I don't know answers to that needs to be in place. You'll never have all the answers. It's sort of arrogant to think you will. It's arrogant to think you will. And you can just trust God's word. Sometimes you don't find a good answer. Sometimes, sadly, as you're searching for apologetic stuff, you only find bad answers, but that doesn't mean there isn't a good answer. Right? Perhaps for some issues of theology and apologetics, there were bad answers for hundreds of years, and then somebody found something and were like, boom, that's the solution. We found the right answer. But for hundreds of years when there was no answer, those Christians still should have had faith in God's word. They shouldn't have pretended and used bad answers. They should have just said, I don't know, but I still trust God's word because it has credibility to me. And cred credibility means that. It means, I think it's credible. Um, my faith is not a house of cards. Unanswered questions are okay. Personally, I'm sort of used to it now. I have some questions I don't have answers to. All my major, major questions, all my biggest issues, I have answers to. Some stuff I don't know, and I'm okay with that. I don't currently know the best understanding of Genesis chapters like 1 through 11. 
I know a bunch of options and possibilities and I'm not really sure. Um, I'm annoyed that I don't have a good answer for you guys on that right now. I'd like to know one of these days. I'd like to chase that down and devote more study time to it. It's not going to ruin my faith. It's not going to stop me from praying and trusting the Lord hears me because I don't expect me, Mike Winger, to know everything and answer everything. And you shouldn't expect that of yourself either. So now we're ready to dig into this passage in detail theologically and to get all the meat that's there to change our lives. But that's going to be next week as we continue the Mark series. But I like to close in prayer. Thank you guys so much for joining me. And um, yeah, I appreciate you guys being here. It's exciting to me. Honestly, I, I keep mentioning it. The fact that we have like over 1500 people live right now. And I know a couple of you are like, is he really live? I'm really live. I just don't read the live chat while I'm live because I can't teach and read the live chat at the same time. Um, but it, it blesses me so much that you guys are excited about this. Like here you are locked in and sitting around for this. You know it's going to be a long video and we're going to get into nitty gritty and details. And it's, it's so rewarding though, right? It's like addicting to just learn the word of God. And I want to, I want to pass that addiction on to as many people as possible. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Um, Lord, we thank you for the goodness of your word that even as we compare these different accounts, we, we end up finding over and over again the confirmation and the consistency uh, of it, it's, it's pretty amazing. And maybe we don't understand every answer to every question, but we have so many good answers at this point. And apologetics has gone so far that there's so many good, reasonable solutions to problems and strong support, evidential support for the Christian faith. We stand in a place that it's pretty amazing. We're very privileged in that sense uh, nowadays, and we're just very grateful. God, but we, we pray now for our hearts because it's not just a head issue. Faith is a heart issue as well. And while we may have good answers intellectually, we might have heart issues that are causing us to be wavering. And on that, we pray now, Lord, we pray that we trust you and that we choose to trust you, that you've earned our trust. And it's silly that we've not trusted you at any point here. We trust you now. And we pray only that you'd help us persevere because we know that this testing of our faith is going to cause us to grow in character and patience and godliness and faithfulness. It's going to turn out for our own good and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's all. Okay. And coffee.